Hey guys, welcome back. Today we are talking about Campbell's Biology and Focus Chapter 22, which is called The Origin of Species. This is going to be all about how species have um, arisen over time. So the mystery of mysteries here. So in the Galapagos Islands, that's where Darwin did most of his research, right? He discovered a lot of plants and animals that were found nowhere else on Earth. So if they weren't found anywhere else, then how did they get there? It's an event called speciation, which is the development of a new species. And that's what this entire chapter talks about. How are these different species likely to come about? These are all the different uh, concepts that have been put in place to describe the uh, speciation events to create a new species. So speciation is the process by which one species splits into two or more species. So this is you know, obviously evolution, that's what we're talking about here still, but this is development, the development of a completely new species. So speciation explains the features shared between some organisms due to inheritance from their recent common ancestors. Now, remember when we talked about phylogeny that the common ancestors are kind of like those node points, but then you have branches that extend from there. So then you have distinct species that develop after the common ancestor. And we're gonna look at the mechanisms that have created those species today. Okay, so speciation forms a conceptual bridge between microevolution and macroevolution. So previously we've talked about microevolution, which is evolution in a population. So microevolution consists of changes in allele frequency in a population over time. Now we just recently talked about that one in the last chapter. So we talked about how populations change over time. That's the definition of real evolution. Um, macroevolution is gonna be more of a broad spectrum. It refers to the broad patterns of evolutionary change above the species level. So this is actually how we're creating new species. Okay, so the biological species concept emphasizes reproductive isolation. So what does this mean? So species is a Latin word for kind or appearance. And typically you can separate different species based on their types or their appearances. Um, biologists compare morphology, the way that it um, is shaped, physiology, the biochemistry, and DNA sequences when grouping organisms. And we've kind of all talked about this when we talked about phylogenetic trees and how we show evolutionary relatedness previously. So what is the biological species concept? So it states that a species is a group of populations whose members have the potential to interbreed, so to mate with each other in nature, so not in a laboratory setting, right? And produce viable fertile offspring that do not breed successfully with other populations. So essentially you have organisms that are able to produce offspring. Those offspring are able to produce offspring as well. That's what a fertile offspring is that are viable, which means that they survive. They're not like sickly and die off really early. So a species is anything that can breed together, occupy a similar area typically. Um, that's, that's what a species is. So gene flow between populations holds the populations together genetically. We previously have talked about gene flow of how we introduce uh, different alleles into other populations. And this is how populations are held together um, genetically because they're introducing alleles and changing the allele frequencies slightly to resemble the populations that are surrounding them. So here we see um, the similarity between different species, but also the diversity within a species. So the first picture here is of some birds and you can see that, you know, like they look pretty similar upon first glance. You might even think that they're the same species. They have similar body shape, similar coloration, but they are actually distinct biological species. They are different, uh, different species. They have different songs that they sing. They have other behaviors that are different and it's different enough to prevent them from interbreeding in the wild. So unless you put these two birds in a cage together in, in a laboratory or something, like they're not going to mate in the wild because their behavior is very different and it created two distinct biological species. Now, when you look at the other side, the diversity within a species, these are all obviously humans and all humans can interbreed, which means that they can produce viable offspring together Right, but we have a very large variety of traits in the human population, but we're still the same species. So you can have similarities between different species, but you can also have a very large diversity within a singular species. Next, we're gonna talk about reproductive isolation. So reproductive isolation is the existence of biological barriers that impede two species from producing viable and fertile offspring. Notice those two words are always used. Viable means that they're able to survive and fertile means that they're able to have their own offspring. 
Okay, um, hybrids are offspring of crosses between different species. You're creating a hybrid, you're mixing the two together. And oftentimes, not 100%, but oftentimes they are either not viable and or not fertile, that they can't have their own offspring. So that's something special about hybrids. Um, and reproductive isolation can be classified by whether the barriers are acting before or after fertilization. So you know that fertilization is the event when you have a sperm and an egg and they come together. That creates a fertilized egg, right? That's like when you have N plus N to get 2N because you're restoring the uh, diploid, in our case, because we're humans or diploid organisms, the diploid chromosome number, right? So we're going to talk about two different types of barriers of whether it is before fertilization or after fertilization. Okay, so this big chart kind of shows you everything and it is on page 420 and 421 in your textbook and it has a whole bunch of like little examples and everything there for you. That's what you can see in the pictures. But this is the overall view. So you have the prezygotic barriers, prezygotic. What's pre? Pre means before. What's zygotic? Sounds like zygote. What is a zygote? It is the first diploid cell to create an organism. So that means it's a fertilized egg. So before fertilized egg barriers. So this is before the egg and the sperm come together. Pre-zygotic. Post-zygotic would be post means after. Zygotic sounds like zygote. A zygote is a fertilized egg. So after fertilized egg barriers. So that's the separation here, either before you actually have the fertilized egg or after you have the fertilized egg. These are reproductive barriers. So they're called prezygotic and postzygotic. So when we're looking at the prezygotic barriers, we have habitat isolation, temporal isolation, behavioral isolation, mechanical isolation, and gametic isolation. And then with postzygotic, we have reduced hybrid uh, viability, reduced hybrid fertility, and hybrid breakdown. And we've roughly like barely talked about those first two for postzygotic. Um, but then in the prezygotic, everything, uh, it tells you in the name what it is. So we're going to go through all of those examples and I will define those for you. But this is a really good picture to come back to if you forget where these kind of lay underneath our reproductive isolation and the different types of barriers. Okay. So prezygotic barriers block fertilization. Pre before zygote, the fertilized egg right? It's before fertilization. So it's impeding different species from attempting to mate, which means that they're not supposed to mate together, um, preventing the successful completion of mating. So whether sperm and egg are in the same area or not, they're not going to come together. And then hindering fertilization of mating is successful here. Okay, so prezygotic is all happening. All these different barriers exists to prevent the egg and the sperm from even coming together to create a fertilized egg. Okay, so the first one is habitat isolation. So two species encounter each other very rarely or not at all because they occupy different habitats, even though not isolated by physical barriers. So they could just live in different areas. And obviously, if they're not ever exposed to each other, then they're not going to interact with each other in order to produce offspring. Um, and then the example that it gives you with like, oops, the little snakes A and B there. Um, those are two different snakes that are occupying. They live in the same area, but one of them is typically an aquatic snake and the other is terrestrial. So one lives in the water most of the time and one is on the land most of the time. They're just not going to come into contact with each other. So that is habitat isolation. While they're found in the same general areas, they just one prefers the water and one prefers the land. They're not going to run into each other. There's not going to be a fertilization event occurring. The next one is called temporal isolation. Um, species that breed at different times of the day, different seasons or different years are not going to mix their gametes, right? This is common with birds. Um, the example that it gives you in the textbook is talking about skunks. There's two different skunks that look very similar to each other. Their territory actually overlaps but one of them breeds in the winter and one of them breeds in the summer. So if you're one of these skunks that's trying to, you know, Netflix and chill in the summer, you're not going to, you know, complete a mating ritual or whatever with one of the ones that breeds in the winter because you're breeding at different times. They're just, it's like a circadian rhythm within the animal themselves. So it's based on when they like to breed they're just not going to be doing it at the same time. So that is your temporal isolation. 
The next one is a behavioral isolation, which is when you have courtship rituals and other behaviors that are unique to a species that are effective barriers. Um, the example, I love these animals that it gives you in the book is a blue footed booby. So it's a bird in the Galapagos islands. Um, basically it's really common with birds that they have all different courtship dances and things like that, that happen. Obviously two different species are going to have two different behavioral courtship rituals, which another species is not going to go for because that's not like what's ingrained in them. Right. So it's a behavioral isolation. Also with birds, it's really common that their songs are different. So they're not going to, um, you know, interbreed because they can recognize each other as different. Next, we have mechanical isolation. So this is morphological differences preventing successful mating. So think about morphological as in structures and shapes. So literally, you can't fit the square peg in the round hole. You can think about it like that. Okay, the example that it gives you in the book is um, dealing with snails. There are two different species of snails that their shells spiral opposite directions. So if they were trying to mate together, like their parts are going in different ways. So mating can't be like their genital openings can't meet up. Like they can't align. You're not going to have a successful mating ritual if you can't get your genitals close together. Anyway, that's what mechanical isolation is. The parts literally don't fit. The mechanics are off. Okay. And then we have gametic isolation. So the sperm of one species may not be able to fertilize the eggs of another species. Um, oftentimes the shape of the head of the sperm are just different shapes depending on the different species. And they're actually not able to uh, penetrate the the egg, there's like a coating around the outside of the egg as like a protective barrier. And if it's the wrong shape sperm, the wrong shape head, um, the tail is built in a way that it's not strong enough to kind of drill through that protective membrane on the outside of the egg. All of these things um, in the book, it gives you an example of sea urchins. Um, and it talks about how like this, the surface proteins on their, uh, eggs and sperm, depending on the different species, like they won't stick together if it's the wrong species. So again, it's kind of like the, uh, mechanical isolation, but mechanical isolation is more of the genitals can't come together. Okay. And then in gametic isolation, it's the actual gametes, uh, like the sperm of one species might not be able to fuse with the egg. So we're talking about the actual gametes there. Okay. So next is our post zygotic barriers. So this is after the egg and the sperm have already come together. There is a fertilized egg, which is the first step in creating a new organism, a tiny organism, a baby organism. Okay, so post zygotic barriers prevent the hybrid zygote from developing into a viable fertile adult by either reduced hybrid viability, reduced hybrid fertility, or hybrid breakdown. So those are the three options for after we have a fertilized egg these are again reproductive isolation these are barriers to prevent species intermingling essentially okay so reduced hybrid um, viability this is when we have genes of the different parent species that may interact and impair the hybrids development or survival um, so the example that the book gives you is dealing with a salamander um, that lives in the um there are two different salamanders that are going to live in the same regions and habitats uh, where they might hybridize, which means produce a hybrid offspring. Uh, but most of these hybrids don't complete development, which just means that there's, it could be like, you know, with different organisms, they have different numbers of genes. They have different numbers of chromosomes. They have different numbers of a lot of things, right? So if you actually have a fertilized egg, it might just not develop because it has the wrong number of chromosomes. And it's like, ooh, there's a lot of uh, issues going on here. This is not gonna be a viable offspring. The next one is reduced hybrid fertility, which we've talked about. So even if hybrids are um, vigorous, they may be sterile. So if they are viable and living in strong organisms, they might still be sterile in that they can't go on and reproduce. That's all that that means. And that's common, like I said, with ligers the other day and mules. They cannot reproduce with each other or either of the parent species in order to produce offspring. They are just sterile. Okay, and then lastly, our last post barrier is called hybrid breakdown. 
So some first generation hybrids are fertile, which means that they can have offspring. But when, um, when they mate with another species or with either of the parental species, the offspring of the next generation are feeble, so like kind of weak or sterile. So while we have like the first generation might be fine, as that hybrid goes on to produce more offspring, that each, um, each of the following generations is going to be like a less and less stable organism and they might become sterile. Okay, so we've been talking about the biological species concept, but there are limitations to this concept. So the biological species concept can actually not be applied to fossils or asexual organisms, which includes all of our prokaryotic organisms. Um, it's hard, obviously, to tell if fossils were able to reproduce with other different types of fossils because you don't know a lot about them. Um, the biological species concept emphasizes an absence of gene flow, but we do know that gene flow does occur between different organisms and between different species. So some of the examples that we've talked about were like mules, ligers, and now there's this new thing called a growler bear, and it looks like this. Growler bears. It's a grizzly and a polar bear that have gotten together to create a hybrid growler bear. They look a little bit crazy. Okay, so the biological species concept that we've been talking about is actually one of only like over 20 different types of concepts, species concepts here. So other species concepts emphasize the unity within a species rather than the separateness of the different species, like the biological concept does. So the morphological species concept defines a species by its structural features, and it applies to sexual and asexual species, but relies on subjective criteria. Okay, so that's the morphological one, which is again based on shape, the body shape and other structural features um, of the organisms. And the disadvantage of this approach is that it relies on the subjective criteria and researchers actually can disagree on which structural features are distinguished um, distinguish each particular species. Okay, there's two more that this briefly talks about here. So the ecological species concept views a species in terms of its ecological niche that it occupies. So it applies to sexual and asexual species and emphasizes the role of the disruptive selection. So this views the species in terms, again, of the ecological niche uh, and then the sum of how the members of that species interact with both of the abiotic and biotic factors of their environment, okay? And then the phylogenetic species concept defines a species as the smallest group of indiv individuals on a phylogenetic tree. So this is talking about like the node and the branches that kind of like follow along like one branch. That would be the smallest quote group of individuals on this phylogenetic tree. And it us um, it's usually applied to both sexual and asexual species, because both of them can be plotted on a phylogenetic tree, um, but it can be difficult to determine the degree of difference required for separate species. Okay, so it's that doesn't really like play on differences. The phylogenetic species doesn't really play on differences because with the phylogenetic tree, you're looking at relatedness, not differentness. So it just kind of depends on what different definition of a species and definition of um, the species concepts you want to look at, but there's actually over 20 different kinds. Those are just the ones that are outlined in your book. Okay, so speciation can take place with or without geographic separation. So we've talked about reproductive barriers and we have prezygotic and postzygotic. We also have different speciation events that can take place on whether there is a geographic isolation um, event happening or not. So speciation can occur in these two ways as well. So allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation. So we'll go through and talk about those. Okay, so here you can see in our original pond up at the top and then it's divided into A and B. So allopatric speciation is when we have the formation of new species while geographically isolated. So you can see there that the lake must have dried up a little bit. You have two different species now. Now these two species will potentially have, you know, different pressures put on them to um, eventually create different species altogether that actually, if they meet back up, won't be able to uh, produce viable offspring. And the second picture, you have the sympatric speciation. Um, so you have a subset of this species that's actually gonna form a new species without geographic separation. So this one, there is no barrier like between the organisms, but still there's a subset that actually breaks off and creates a new species while still in the same geographic area. 
Okay, so let's talk about these. So allopatric is also called the other country speciation. So allopatric, and so in allopatric speciation, gene flow is interrupted when a population is divided into geographically isolated subpopulations. So just like the pond, this is when you have an original population that gets split by a geographic barrier. Um, so an example here, you have the flightless birds of the Galapagos that originated from flying species from the mainland because how else would they have gotten there, right? So species from the mainland of the Chilean coast have flown to these islands, the Galapagos Islands, and we have the development of flightless birds there. Well, they've separated from the original species and through generations and generations have adapted to their new environments. And it seems that it was advantageous to not be a flying bird on this particular island. And that is how you have allopatric speciation. You have a geographic um, boundary barrier that has occurred, like, you know, the ocean that has occurred between these different species. And they have developed to their own surroundings and have become different species. Okay, so the process. So the definition of a geographic barrier depends on the ability of the population to disperse. So with birds, it's gonna be a little bit harder, right? Because, you know, they can fly. Um, so for example, you have a canyon that might create a barrier for small rodents because a canyon is quite large and, you know, cavernous. Um, but birds could just fly across the canyon, it would be no problem, right? Um, birds, coyotes, or pollen, pollen especially, because that can be carried in the wind, it can be carried by other organisms. There would have to be a very, very large uh, geographic barrier to prevent pollen from spreading. Okay, so separate populations, once they're separated, must evolve independently, so each on their own, um, through mutation, natural selection, and genetic drift. Now remember, because they're geographically isolated from each other, that they might be experiencing different um, environmental factors, even if they're in the same area, like think about it like a mountain, if you're on the you know, high side of it versus the low side of it, the, the temperature, the water, it's all gonna be very different, right? Um, reproductive isolation may arise as a result of the genetic divergence, which we've talked about previously, the reproductive isolation barriers. Um, so for example, mosquito fish in the Bahamas comprise several isolated populations in different ponds. So obviously if you have a flood, it's going to unite kind of all of those ponds. And then when things start to dry up a little bit after the flooding is over, you might have a redistribution of your fish that are then going to live in their respective ponds isolated from the other ones and then develop whatever advantageous traits over generations and generations are going to be good for that particular location. Um, so here's an example of that with the, the fish in the Bahamas. Um, so in A, this is under high predator, uh, predatory uh, threat, so high predation. So there's a lot of predators here. So the body shape enables rapid bursts of speed to evade a predator. And then in B, you have lower predation. So the body shape is going to favor long, steady uh, swimming. So these two fish in, and probably originated from the same pond, but then after they became geographically isolated, they have slight differences um, to make them better adapt to their new environments. But now they're actually different species. So when they come back together, they most likely will not be able to reproduce together. Okay, so next we'll talk about the evidence of allopatric speciation. So there are 15 pairs of sister species of these snapping crab, uh, crabs, snapping shrimp that exist um, that are separated by the Isthmus of Panama. Okay, so we'll look at a picture of that in a minute. Um, these species originated from 9 million to three, uh, 3 million years ago. So very, very old species. And when the Isthmus of Panama formed, so a geographic barrier, um, and it separated the Atlantic and Pacific waters. So you can see the obstruction here, our geographic barrier, the Isthmus of Panama. Okay, so you see that there's these four different species that have all, um, you know, slightly different characteristics. They look like, you know, they're pretty close, but if you look closely, there are some uh, phenotypic differences between them. Um, so in this picture, you'll see that the the shrimp are pictured and you have 15 different pairs of the sister species. You only see a couple of them here. Um, that arose from an initial population that was actually divided by the formation of the isthmus. And then uh, you kind of, it has them color coded, but in here they're black and black. Uh, so here you can see that this species here is also similar to this species here. These are more closely related and these two are more closely related. 
when compared to each other. Okay, but there are actually 15 different subsets of the species that have developed because of these little pockets that have been created around the Isthmus of Panama. So regions where many geographic barriers typically um, have more species uh, than regions with fewer barriers. So if you have a whole lot of geographic barriers, each one of those barriers presents a new opportunity for a speciation event through allopatric speciation, the development of a new species. Whereas in regions where you have very few geographic barriers, you're only going to have few possibilities of speciation events through allopatric speciation. So you'll see um, less diverse species there. Um, so reproductive isolation between populations generally increases as the geographic distance between them increases, which makes sense. So again, reproductive isolation is all the um, barriers that we've talked about previously. So the further apart these distances, um, you know, put the two populations, of course, it's going to be less likely that they're going to be able to get together and successfully reproduce. Uh, barriers to reproduction are um, intrinsic and the separation itself is not a biological barrier. So just separating the two is not necessarily a biological barrier, but when you start to, you know, adapt to your new environment and develop these different traits and over many, many, many generations, your genes are actually changing, then it does create these barriers to prevent um, you know, successful reproduction between these two new distinct species. Um, intrinsic reproductive barriers can uh, develop in experimentally isolated populations. And the example that your book gives you with that is about fruit flies, like they grew fruit, well, they grew fruit, wow, they grew fruit flies, tongue twister, uh, on different media. Some of them were raised eating on um, like a starch media and some of them were raised eating more of a maltose containing media. And then when they put them together after a few generations, it was more likely that the ones that ate starch bred with other flies that ate starch and the ones that ate maltose were more likely to breed with other flies that ate maltose. But then if they switched the media that they were present on, if they were able to adapt to the new media, it didn't really matter which of the original quote populations they came from. Okay, so um, through our experimentally isolated populations, you do have barriers that um, kind of come and go depending on the uh, environment of these species. And the environment in this case in the laboratory setting being the food source. Okay, the other kind is sympatric speciation, which is same country. So this is when we don't have some huge barrier that's developed in the middle of our population. So in sympatric speciation, speci speciation takes place in populations um, that live in the same geographic area. So they're living in the same area. They're not being divided by like a mountain range or an ocean or anything like that. Okay, so sympatric speciation occurs when gene flow is reduced between groups that remain in contact through factors including polyploidy, habitat differentiation, and sexual selection. So they're occupying the same territory, but for some reason, um, factors including the ones that we just listed, there is um, less contact between some of the individuals until eventually you have two different groups or more that become their own species. Okay, so we'll look and uh, define these. So polyploidy is the first one. Um, it's the presence of extra sets of chromosomes due to accidents during cell division. So this is common when you have like a non-disjunction event and you have gametes that have like too many or too few um, sets of chromosomes. So when it's too many, it's called polyploidy. So when you have extra sets of chromosomes, you don't really see this in like uh, animals so much as you do in plants, like actually something about like 80% of plants have some sort of uh, polyploidy speciation events in their lineage. So poly like I said, polyploidy is much more common in plants because in uh, animals, for some reason, it's a lot more um, disastrous to have extra sets of chromosomes. Um, you can also have an autoploidy uh, autoploid, which is an individual that has um, more than two sets of chromosomes and they're derived from, that are derived from one species. And that's more rare, but it does exist again in plants. Um, so in plants, for example, you might have a failure of cell division that could double the cell's chromosome numbers from the diploid number to a tetraploid number, tetra meaning four. And then these tetraploids, again in plants, can produce fertile tetraploid offspring by self-pollinating. Again, that's why it makes sense that it would happen in plants. 
Um, the offspring of matings between autoploids and diploids have reduced fertility though. So this is what I was just saying there. So um, if you have a cell division error that causes a tetraploid, when that tetraploid goes in through meiosis and makes um, its gametes, its gametes are going to actually be the 2N number and then the new species will have the 4N. So this is why it works the best if they're self-pollinating because they're actually using the same chromosomal number Whereas if they're trying to breed with a different organism that is, you know, basically diploid, um, the, you know, the, the normal organism is diploid, now you have a weird set of chromosomes. So it works the best if tetraploids actually breed with themselves or with other tetraploids in order to have the correct set of chromosomes. You also have something that is called an alloploid which is a species with multiple sets of chromosomes derived from different species. And, um, Allo, uh, polyploids, sorry, it's allopolyploids, um, that they cannot interbreed with either parent species. They can only interbreed with themselves. So again, with that self-pollination or other allopolyploids that you can actually mate with, but you can't actually go back and interbreed with either the parental species that created this organism. A lot of our crops, uh, cotton, oats, potatoes, tobacco, wheat are polyploids. And like I said, that's uh, about 80% of the plant species that are on the planet today are derivatives of polyploid speciation events. Okay, the next thing is habitat differentiation. Again, we're talking about sympatric, which is in the same country, speciation events. So sympatric speciation can also result from the appearance of new ecological niches. So for example, the North American maggot fly can live on native um, hawthorn trees, as well as more recently introduced apple trees. So this just means that they might have literally a difference in, in their habitats. Okay, and lastly, we have sexual selection. Um, so sexual selection can drive sympatric speciation. So if you have a species and suddenly like some traits are being more uh, sought after by certain uh, participants in that species or in that population, then they're going to, if they keep only breeding with those specific organisms, then you're going to have the separation of the species there. So sexual selection for mates of different colors has likely contributed to speciation events in the cichlid fish of Lake Victoria. Um, so we'll go on and talk about that a little bit. There was an experiment to kind of like examine what's happening in Lake Victoria with the different speciation events of the cichlids. They're just these like colorful fish that live there. So the experiment was basically having two different sets of light. So you have fish that are present in normal light. You have two different species of fish that are present under normal light and you can see the differences between them. Whereas if you put them underneath like a harsh orangey light, they look a lot more similar here, right? Yes, their body styles are a little bit different, but if you're a fish, like you're probably not like focusing that hard. Whereas the coloration here is very obviously different, right? So under normal light, fish of one species were more likely to mate with their own species and respective here as well, fish of this species bred with their own species. But then in the other fish tank that had that like harsh orange light that caused all of them to look like this, it didn't matter. They interbred between them. So in Lake Victoria, the water is becoming cloudier and cloudier each year, which is causing the cichlids to stop only breeding with their own species, but now they're mixing with the other species that are present in the pond. And it's actually creating speciation events to create even more species, again, that are all phenotypically distinct from each other. Okay, so here's a review of the allopatric and sympatric speciation events. So in allopatric speciation, there is a geographic isolation that restricts gene flow between two, diff two different populations. So allopatric has the geographic isolation factor. Reproductive isolation may then arise by natural selection, genetic drift, or sexual selection in the isolated populations. Um, even if contact is restored between the populations, interbreeding is prevented by reproductive barriers. And those are the ones we've talked about pre um, previously. And then on the flip side, in sympatric, they're occupying the same territory. There is no geography interfering here. So sympatric speciation, a reproductive barrier, isolates a subset of the population without any geographic separation from the parent species. Sympatric speciation can result from polyploidy, natural selection, or sexual selection, like we've just talked about. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about are hybrids, okay? So there's all these mechanisms in place to prevent uh, 
to prevent organisms from coming together to successfully reproduce. But then if they do, they create hybrids. So hybrid zones reveal factors that cause reproductive isolation. So a hybrid zone is a region in which members of different species mate and produce hybrids. So essentially this is like the territory between two um, populations where they're going to intermingle, if you will. So hybrids are a result of mating between species with incomplete reproductive barriers. This means that they are able to produce offspring. Okay, so usually, like we talked about with the postzygotic uh, barriers, usually the hybrids are not as healthy or as strong or um, fertile as the parent species, but occasionally they can reproduce. Okay, um, hybrids are just typically not as vigorous. Okay, so this is when we have in, um, incomplete reproductive barriers that exist, we are allowed to have hybrids there. Okay. So patterns within hybrid zones. So a hybrid zone can occur in a single band where adjacent species meet. So you have population A, you have population B, they're separated, but in, somewhere in between them, they're able to intermingle. And this has happened with these uh, toads. It's like the well-studied example. Uh, you have these like yellow-bellied toads and fire-bellied toads. Does it show you a picture? Yes, it does. Okay. So you can see that you have the yellow-bellied toad region where they occupy where they live okay and then over here you have the fire belly toad region where they occupy where they live but then this red band is kind of like the overlap that exists between the two species okay so the hybrid zone is where you have the fire belly and the yellow belly able to interact and produce offspring okay so basically this graph is showing you the pattern of species specific allele frequencies across the width of the zone um, in Poland, which is where these live. Okay, so individuals with frequencies close to one are the yellow-bellied toads, and individuals with frequencies close to zero are the fire-bellied or the red ones, and individuals with intermediate frequencies are considered to be the hybrids. So that's why they are in the hybrid zone there. Okay, so hybrids often have reduced fitness compared to the parent species, which we've talked about. And again, fitness is not, I like to pick things up and put things down. Fitness is the ability to survive and reproduce. You are contributing your genes to the next uh, generation. Um, the distribution of hybrid zones can be more complex. if Parent species are found in patches within the same region because obviously you'll have a whole bunch of different hybrid zones occurring. Okay, so hybrid zones over time. So when closely related species meet in a hybrid zone, there are three possible outcomes. There can be the reinforcement of the hybrid, um, of the reinforcement of the species, so more of a separation, a fusion event, which would create a new species, and stability, which kind of just keeps everything the same. Okay, so this is what this looks like. So it's the formation of the hybrid zone and the possible outcomes for hybrids over a period of time. Okay, so you can see the gray arrow that are like showing the different populations. You have the purple arrow is like the hybrid zones, and then you have the possible outcomes at the ends. Okay, so kind of in this range here, we're talking about the three populations of a species that are connected by gene flow. Okay, so it's the same species, they're connected by gene flow, which means occasionally you have uh, mating events between organisms from different populations. Okay, and then here in this general area, you have a barrier to gene flow that's established, okay? It's a, it's a barrier that's separating one from the others, so a physical barrier of some kind, okay? Um, then in around this area where you start to see a slight difference here because we've gone from blue to now this like purpley color, this population is beginning to diverge from the other two populations because again, they're still sharing gene flow, which means that they're gonna be pretty similar, whereas this one is now not interbreeding with the other two populations. It's going to become more different. And then um, in this area here, we have gene flow is reestablished by a hybrid zone. So there is a geographic area where these two, well, these two and this one particular populations are able to commingle and you have a hybrid zone. So you have hybrid individuals that have been created between the populations. Now the possible outcomes are reinforcement, fusion, or stability which you can see here that that's what they would look like. Okay, so it's showing you if the arrow continues, what would happen. Okay, so reinforcement is when you have the strengthening of these reproductive barriers and the hybrids are going to gradually cease to be formed. This means that you will have either prezygotic or postzygotic barriers that are going to be strengthened or reinforced to 
overall prevent hybrids from occurring between these populations. In fusion, notice that the arrow looks a little bit different. You have the alternative, which is the weakening of these reproductive barriers, and the two species actually fuse. So we've actually divided into two different species. The hybrid zone exists, and then if the hybrids are viable and healthy and can able, they're, they're able to reproduce their own offspring, and they're well suited for the environment and all of that, then you'll have a fusion event, which is when you have the barriers weakening, and you'll actually have the two species fuse together. Lastly is stability, which is the continued production of the hybrid individuals. But it's, again, those are gonna be fewer in number than either of the original populations. So everything would just kind of stay the same. That's why those arrows kind of just like level off and like, mm, okay, we still have a hybrid zone, but like they're not stronger than the parents. They're not better suited for the environment than the parents. Um, it's not happening so frequently that you have, uh, you know, a, uh, fusion event and it's not strengthening the reproductive barriers. It's just kind of existing around the same. Okay, so now this will go into that a little bit further. So reinforcement occurs when hybrids are less fit than the parent species. So natural selection strengthens or reinforces the reproductive barriers and over time, the rate of the hybridization decreases. So you should see less hybrids over time. Where reinforcement occurs, reproductive barriers should be stronger for sympatric than for allopatric speciation, because if they are going to occupy the same territory, they should still not be able to breed. That's why it's stronger for sympatric. Okay, the next one that we talked about was called fusion, which is when we have um, the, both parent species are going to create a single species that may occur if hybrids are as fit as the parents, allowing a substantial gene flow between the two different species. Um, for example, researchers think that the pollution in Lake Victoria has reduced the ability of the female cichlids to distinguish males from different species. So they're kind of breeding with all of the males. So there's all kind of intermixing between all of these species. So eventually over many, 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 many generations, if the conditions continue to be the same or worsen, then they'll all kind of resemble each other because yes, originally they have all these different pockets, all these different species with different distinct colors. But then as pollution increases and you can't really see the colors anymore, then that's not going to be um, something that they can uh, use for sexual selection. Like coloration won't be a factor anymore because the, the water is too cloudy. So over time you will have more of like a fusion event occurring. Um, this might be causing the fusion of many different species. So that's what we were talking about previously. Um, you have all of these distinct species that were living in this lake, like hundreds of different distinct species that were living in this lake. But then as pollution has increased over time, you've seen a um, reduced number in these distinct species because now you have more of a blend or a hybrid that kind of has characteristics of both of these organisms uh, because the water is becoming increasingly cloudy and hard to, um, it's hard to distinguish the species from one to the other. Okay, and lastly, the last possible outcome for our hybrids is stability. So stability of the hybrid zone may be achieved if um, extensive gene flow from outside the hybrid zone can overwhelm uh, selection for increased reprodu reproductive isolation inside the hybrid zone. So in a stable hybrid zone, hybrids continue to be produced over time, but they're not going to be, they're not going to exceed the parental species and they're not going to be reduced until there's none of them. It's just kind of something that's stabilized or maintained over time but it's not strong enough to like overpower either of the parental species. Okay, um, so speciation can occur rapidly or slowly and can result from changes in few or many genes. Of course, this all depends on the organism. So many questions um, remain concerning how long it takes for a new species to form or how many genes actually need to um, differ between the species. Um, in some cases, in some organisms, it's a, it's a very small number of genes that would need to change, whereas in others, it's a very large number of genes that would need to change to create new species. Um, so the time course of speciation. So broad patterns in speciation can be studied using the fossil record, morphological data, and molecular data. So our DNA, the shapes of organisms, and what we know from the, pop, the fossil record. Okay, so patterns in the fossil record. We're gonna talk about something called punctuated equilibria here. So the fossil record includes examples of species that appear suddenly, 
um, persist essentially unchanged for uh, some time and then dis uh, apparently disappear altogether. But remember that the fossil record is limited because it's only what was able to be preserved at that particular time. Um, and also, you know, being fossilized, it might not be the entire organism. You're not getting the entire picture. They are extremely helpful in um, evolutionary purposes for relatedness of organisms, but you can't tell everything from a fossil. So it might appear that something just kind of like spontaneously appeared or it spontaneously disappeared. Um, so then we have periods of apparent stasis, which is when things are the same, punctuated, punctuated by sudden changes that are called punctuated equilibria, which we'll talk about in a second. And the punctuated equilibrium model um, contrasts with the model of the gradual change in a species, a species existence. Okay, so punctuated equilibria is basically used to describe the patterns in the fossil record um, of apparent stasis punctuated by sudden change. That's what that means. So things are the same, they're the same, they're the same, up, there's a change. They're the same, they're the same, they're the same, up, there's a change. That's what punctuated equilibria essentially says. So this is a punctuated model and a gradual model. So in the punctuated model for A, you can see that um, new species change um, most as they branch off from the parent species. So you have the node to show you the parent species and then boom, there's a change and then things remain the same, right? That's the punctuated equilibria model over time. Parent species, sudden change, everything stays the same. And then you'd have another sudden change somewhere down the line from here, okay? Whereas the gradual model, um, we have species that diverge from one another more slowly and more steadily and consistently over a long period of time. So you have the parental species that kind of has a slight differentiation. And then at the end, they're quite different, right? But it was a slow and gradual and continuous process to get us to these new species. So speciation rates. Um, the punctuated pattern in the fossil record and evidence from lab studies suggests that speciation can be rapid. Again, this would of course depend on the organism. So for example, there's a particular sunflower that originated from the hybridization of two other sunflower species and quickly diverged into a new species. Okay, and we say quickly diverged, but um, you know, quickly in the sense of evolutionary and speciation time is not like in the blink of an eye. Okay, these are the, the sunflowers here. So it's a hybrid sunflower species and it's um, dry sand dune kind of habitat here, which is not exactly where you would imagine sunflowers to grow. So you have this wild sunflower that originated from a hybridization of these two other sunflowers, which live um, in a more moist environment. Okay, so um, the interval between speciation events can range from as young as 4,000 years with some of those uh, cichlids, the fish that we were talking about, to 40 million years with some beetles, with the average somewhere around 6.5 million years, right, to show you speciation events. So the development of a new species takes, on average, 6.5 million years. So again, evolution is not something that you're going to see in your lifetime because no human has been alive for 6.5 million years, right? Um, it happens very, very gradually. It's more of the gradual model. And it, um, it takes a very, very long time for these uh, changes to be put into place. Okay, so studying the, ge uh, the genetics of speciation. So a fundamental question of evolutionary biology persists. So how many gene genes change when a new species is formed? And again, that answer would kind of depend on the organism itself. So depending on the species in question, speciation might require the change of only a single allele or many alleles. So for example, there's these snails, the direction of the shell spiral affects mating and it's controlled by a single gene. Those are the same snails that we use in the example for mechanical isolation, right? A single gene is enough to cause these two different species to exist because now there is no mating between them because of the mechanical barrier, the prezygotic mechanical barrier there. In monkey flowers, um, two loci affect the flower color, which influences the pollinator preferences. Um, pollination that is dominated by either hummingbirds or bees can lead to the reproductive isolation of, of the flowers because this is how they're able to reproduce with the help of the pollinators. Um, and then in other species, speciation can be influenced by large numbers of genes and gene interactions. Um, these are those two uh, monkey flowers. So you can see like you've got the, uh, the typical one with the, 
this is they call this one the um oh this is the typical this is with a different flower color allele introduced you have a typical flower here and then with a different allele introduced as well so you can see that they're getting the traits from these other species so this is cross pollination because of the different pollinators so locus that influences the pollinator choice so pollinator preferences provide a very strong barrier to the reproduction between these different types of flowers um, to cause you know some differences in them to develop over time to where we have different species because of the preferences of the pollinators. So from speciation to macroevolution. So macroevolution is the cumulative effect of many speciation and extinction events. So again, we've previously talked about microevolution, which was population evolution, which of course the whole population has to evolve in order for it to be really considered population. Otherwise it's um, <laughs> to be considered evolution. Otherwise it's simply a mutation of an individual. But then this is how we macroevolution is really the development of new species. And because as evolution is occurring, you're going to have these like, you know, subsets of species that develop over time as they're adjusting to their environments or to their, you know, new environments for geographical isolation or all those other isolations that we talked about, the temporal, behavioral, all of that, right? So this is how we get new species, which are just the stepping stones to the next species. And that's how evolution works over time. So that is it. That is it for this whole biology uh, 1406 course. Thank you guys for sticking with me and I'll see you next year. Have a great summer.